Buen día a todos. Bienvenidos. Eh, llegó el día. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It is the day for this important seminar on uh, Mr. Barla, Dr. Barla. It will be a very uh, special event. Uh, a very special thanks to our sponsor. We have seen a couple of videos from our uh, sponsor. It is very important because without their support, we wouldn't be able uh, to carry out uh, these uh, seminars or uh, webinars. Thank you very much if, uh, to CISGEO for your support. And thank you to Dr. Barla. Day. It will be a great seminar. Y interacciones entre grandes deslizamientos de tierra e interactions between large landslides and infrastructures. I will introduce Dr. Barla before these just a couple of housekeeping. On the right, on the lower right of uh, on the bottom right of your skin of your screen you can see a world uh, icon where you can click and uh, choose the language of uh, your preference we have live simultaneous interpretations for uh, questions uh, please uh, write them on the q a uh, box uh, once again, on the bottom of your screen, in the middle, at the end of the seminar, and at the end of Dr. Barla's uh, presentation, we will be able to answer your questions. Uh, so uh, please feel free to write them, to type them in. Thank you very much, Dr. Barla, for being with us. Dr. Barla is an associate professor in geotechnical engineering in the Polytechnical of Turin in Italy. He is an expert in tunnels and stability in tunnels. He leads a research group in laboratory tests in soils and rocks, numerical modeling, tunnel excavation, geotechnical monitoring and geostructures. He is uh, editor-in-chief uh, of the American uh, Journal and uh, for other uh, publications too. And uh, he is an advisor uh, to uh, the uh, dean of the university. He is uh, a member of several councils. Uh, Dr. Barlow is an author of a textbook, and he has published about 200 scientific uh, uh, articles in different publications. He has more than 20 years experience as consultant for a company that is part of the Polytechnical of Turin. Please, Miguel Angel, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Juan. Well, we can give the floor to Professor Barla now. So thank you again and, and, and welcome everyone. And th thank you very much. Muchas gracias for the kind words and uh, the invitation. I'm very happy. And um, maybe we can start straight with uh, the presentation. I may try to, to share the screen. Let's see if I'm able to do this. There it is. So can you kindly confirm that uh, you see the slides properly so that I... Yes, the problem. it's okay. It's okay, very good. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for attending. Um, I Look, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, this talk is to um, discuss together uh, this topic, which is mainly interactions, you see the picture here, the photo shows an interaction between a landslide and a motorway. This is in northern Italy, something like 150 kilometers south from where I am speaking now, and occurred in 2019. 
And so the idea is just to share some of the experiences we had here in, uh, in Italy and uh, to discuss them together with you. Uh, <clears throat> I have... Um, I have organized the talk in, uh, let's say, four different uh, sections. Um, I, I understood that we will have a question and answer uh, session at the end, so I'm very happy about that. So feel free to 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 to, to interact at, at the end. So I, I will go through this this list of topics. So very brief in, introduction. And since we, are, we will speak about interaction between lens lines and infrastructures, I will try to um, also, uh, as a follow-up of the videos we saw before, to identify, to address some, well, at least based on my opinion and experience, what are the key aspects to build up a monitoring plan and an early warning system to manage this kind of interaction or treats or uh, uh, because of the of, of lens lines. And after this, I would like to go through two examples, uh, examples taken from the, the experiences here uh, in, in Italy, in Europe. One is related to uh, an interaction between a large landslide and some tunnels, motorway tunnels. And a second example is related to the interaction, the treat of a large landslide with respect to, to an industrial estate and a lake, possible uh, tsunami effect in this lake. Well, these kind of activities and the work that uh, we have done on it were done uh, partially uh, as research projects at the Politecnico di Torino, which is my uh, affiliation, my institution, uh, but also from the practical side by this company, Geosolving, which is a which is a spin-off, a former spin-off company of, uh, of the Politecnico. Uh, but the clients are listed here, so the the uh, uh, big companies that do activities in, in Italy. So of course, I have to thank them for the opportunity to, to show some of the, of the work done together. Now, to start with, so just a, a photograph of, of uh, our country, of Italy. Well, it's not a photograph. In fact, it's a, it's a model, as you see here on the, on the left of the screen. And well, uh, you, I, I, I plotted this just to say, well, in Italy, we have a lot of mountains and hills, as, as you can see here. If you compare Italy, which is this foot here, compared to the rest of Europe. Uh, at present, now I'm here, Torino, where I'm, where I'm living and where I work is here. I hope you can see the arrow. So very close to the mountains and to the hills, as you see, it's just in the middle between the mountains and, and, and the hills. Look, I plotted here another few photographs with some stats, as you see here, mountains, hills, and plains. You see that we only have, over Italy, around 25% of plains. The rest is mountains and, and hills. And these three photos are also taken from my region. In fact, this is the Mont Viso, which is somewhere here. This is the hilly area we have here in the south of Torino, where a lot of uh, we have vineyards and very good red wine. And this is the plains that you can find in this area here, where we grow rice. Most of the rice coming from Europe is from this area. But it's not this the reason why I put these photos here, but it's just to try to, in some way, convince or inform you that we have a lot of hilly and mountain area. That means. And if we want to travel around, we need a lot of bridges and tunnels. And for that reason, motorways, railways around Italy have a large number of bridges, tunnels uh, to, to, to move around. And mountains and hills also um, may cause landslide. And so it's also almost impossible to avoid interaction between landslides and infrastructures like bridges and tunnels. So that's uh, why we have these case studies we're gonna discuss 
uh, today mm, and we have the interest in these kind of, uh, of issues. Now the photo we saw in the opening was related to a relatively uh, small landslide uh, but mm, today we are going to focus on large landslide or uh, deep-seated gravitational deformations uh, which you can see here the definition they are considered gravity induced processes which affect large portions of slopes over long periods of times you see here this I, I plotted this picture here which is comes from from Terzaghi so we're speaking of, of a big landslide look this is just an example of a number, but the ones you, we will see together today have these kind of proportions. So, the, 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 um, let's say the thickness may go up to some hundreds of meters. Uh, the, 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 we, we may have a sliding surface, or sometimes this is not a sliding surface, but it's this layer, a shear band, a shear su surface, uh, and so on. So, this is the kind of phenomenon we're going to look at. Now, Due to these proportions, it is almost impossible from the engineering point of view to design reinforcement methods in order to stabilize this kind of phenomenon. So a, a good uh, option is that of trying to manage when you have interaction with infrastructures or, or, or human life, let's say, to manage this kind of traits by monitoring and building up early warning systems. So that's the topic of this talk here. And we will focus on two examples in, um, in Italy, one from the, uh, the cent center of Italy and the other one from the north of Italy. And you see on your left, this is the motorway going from north to south. And you see these two tunnels here, the yellow dotted line. Will they go through a landslide? You can see here quite a big one, 33 millions of cubic meters. So there is an interaction there. We'll see this in better details later. The second example instead is related to, it's a, it's a smaller one, but still quite large landslide as you see here, which is uh, in an area which was uh, formerly um, an open pit mine. So this was an open pit mine. And the, 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 the potential collapse of a landslide of such uh, dimension could cause damages to an industrial estate, which is down here at the, at the two of the, of, of the slope. But also the collapse would hit this lake that you see here. And potentially could cause a tsunami affecting the villages on the other sides of the lake, as you see in, in the photograph. So that, those are the two issues where you see big interaction between landslide and human life or in infrastructures. Now, I, I don't have any feedback from you. So if there is something wrong in audio or just tell me if you don't say anything, I, I continue on. So um, before we go into the examples, I would like to share some thoughts. Well, I, I, I put the title here, Key Aspects for an Early Warning System. Of course, this is, um, is mainly my opinion, let's say. So I'm, I'm open to, to, to discuss these, these things, but I, I like to go through some principles, let's say, so to, to, to justify what we, the choices we, we made uh, with reference to the, the case study. So first of all, what is an early warning system? Well, an early warning system is a warning system, which includes sensors, like the one, like uh, some of the ones we saw in the, in, in the videos in the, in the opening. A sensor that will are able to detect an event. And as a consequence of the detection, we need to have decision systems to identify dangers. Hmm? Uh, this is a, a well-known uh, flowchart, which um, illustrates, uh, illustrates a little bit uh, the, the sequence, the process of an early warning system. So you need to identify the risk. You need to install some monitoring systems to have some sort of framework, 
analysis, forecasting framework that you use to set thresholds. We will speak about thresholds later. Um, you, 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 you need then to, to set, uh, sorry, I need to close this, yeah, very good. Um, you, you need to set some warning uh, tools, for example, thresholds, and then identify some emergency plans. So that's a typical flowchart of an early warning system. So why do we need these early warning systems? Well, we need them when we have to reduce and mitigate the residual risks. So we can, as I said before, in Italy, we have, it's a little bit simplistic, but of course, but we have a lot of mountains, a lot of hills. It is impossible not to go through the, these, uh, these environment um, without building bridges and tunnels if you want to move around. And this causes some residual risk, some residual risk due to natural phenomena. Okay, so that's what we are talking about here. Now, um, the key aspects for an early warning system, having defined it, what an early warning system is. Just three principles, okay? I, I told you, this is an opinion. We can discuss about it. Number one, the quality of measurement. So it's very important. The quality of measurement is very important. We'll see what I mean with that. Redundancy, principle number two. When I mean when I say redundancy, I mean in terms of instrument, in terms of the, what we we measure, in terms of hierarchy. So not all the sensors have the same role. Okay, we'll go into this detail later. And number three is to be able to make to make what we say prediction and performance. So to be able to look at measured data within a reliable and updated forecast framework. So to have a framework that allow us to understand what is the meaning of what we are measuring. Okay, well, I, I will try to explain this in other words in, in a few minutes. So these are the, in my personal opinion, the three key aspects of an early warning system. Number one, the quality of measurements. So it sounds rather obvious, but we, we should choose the appropriate instrument for the contest. So depending on what we want to monitor, we have to choose the appropriate instrument. We saw in the videos uh, before some um, examples of, uh, there, there were a number of um, instruments there. Uh, I plotted here just two instruments. Just to remind us, well, the, the first one here on the top, it's a, a ground-based interferometric radar. And the second one is a fiber optic kind of a sensor. So just two of them. Uh, but, but to remind us that today, we have a lot of measuring tools available, much more than in the past. And we can choose among them, and not all the systems are appropriate for all the context. I don't know, this one, the ground-based radar interferometric system is a super technological uh, a tool that we as engineers and geologists like to use. However, it's not appropriate for all the problems. Hmm? So it is important that we choose the appropriate instrumentation. And of course, it's also important that measurement precision and accuracy are consistent with thresholds. We'll see in a few minutes what we mean with thresholds, but it, is, it makes no sense to have a threshold defined in terms of a tenth of a millimeter if we cannot measure a tenth of a millimeter. So things need to be consistent. Hmm? What we do from the computational point of view with what we do from the measuring point of view. And of course, as in all uh, human uh, activities, cost is also there. So we have to consider that as well. Um, in, in my lectures, when I, I teach numerical modeling in geotechnical engineering to my students, and I always put this picture here, this is not, now it's not applied to numerical modeling, but it's applied to monitoring, but I think it applies as well the same, that if you put, if, if, if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. I mean, if, if you do not, put effort on the quality of the measurements, what you get as, as a result 
is probably a, some numbers which are not so reliable. So it is very important to have a good quality of measurement so that, that we can use them for, for example, warning purposes. The second principle, second principle is redundancy. Now, in terms of redundancy, uh, what I mean is that um, sensors should be redundant in, by number and by type. For example, if you want to monitor uh, surface movements of a landslide, then we cannot do it in one single point. We have to me measure many positions. And maybe we should not use the same kind of sensor. We can change them. We will see in the examples in a, in a few minutes some examples of how we applied redundancy into our monitoring plan. Of course, redundancy is not just number and type of sensor, but also related to everything like power supply, data transmission system, uh, archiving system. So it applies to, to everything. Yeah? This is more evident probably, but it also applies to, to, to all the rest. And the third, uh, the third principle was prediction and performance. So we need to set thresholds, mm, thresholds, which are values, numerical values, numbers, uh, which highlight a variation in the behavior of the system, of the landslide system. So a variation that may cause an increase in hazard. Mm -hmm. So we have to define it. How can we do that? Well, in order to define thresholds, we use geological and geotechnical studies. And particularly, um, I, I allow me to divide things in two big families, okay? Again, it's a little bit simplistic, but allow me to do that. You, you, we may use some sort of what we can call phenomenological methods, prediction methods. So by we observe and we try to learn from what we observe. We try to, to define some behavioral uh, framework and, and we use this uh, learning activity to define thresholds. We, we, we do this as humans since, since a long time. Artificial intelligence is something like this, is learning by evaluating data, collecting data. Hmm? The second family is doing modeling, analyzing, quantitative kind of analyzing. So this calls for all the, all the um, ability, let's say, of, uh, of uh, geologists and geotechnical engineers in the characterization of geomech geomechanical characterization of geomaterials, in constitutive modeling, in numerical modeling, and of course, then in validating against the uh, monitoring data. So we need to build models. Today, we can do three-dimensional models like this. We will see an example later. And we can use this to define thresholds and also to uh, build that uh, framework that we like to use to evaluate monitoring. So we have the framework, which is the scenario, the prediction, and we get monitoring, which is reality. And we can continuously compare uh, with the scenario to see if we are on track or not. Okay, that's, I think, is the uh, third key aspect. Just don't forget that the early warnings, an early warning system, a good early warning system is not something that you do once and then you forget it, it evolves with time. So you have to adapt it, uh, see what happens, try to manage false alarm, define procedures, modify the procedures and, and, and so on. Okay, It is something that evolves. You have to follow, follow it closely. Also, you have, you have to make um, experiment, experiments on, on the thresholds and, and so on, but we'll see an example later. So uh, this was some ideas. I would try to show them, let's say, applied to these two case studies. The first one is the interaction between the deep-seated deformation and tunnels. You see here a photo of the tunnel. Now, uh, the, 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 the motor of the landslide, in this case, you, you see here a cross-section. Okay, In fact, this is a numerical model. You already recognize it. but uh, You'll soon see also the geological cross-section, but the colors are related to geology somehow. But it's just to tell you, look, that the, 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 the motor of this um, 
of this uh, landslide is time dependent behavior of the geomaterial. So it's creep. Here we have the typical creep curve, primary, secondary, tertiary. Group. So this is the phenomena we are observing. And on, the, on this layer here, which is a sheer layer there, that layer is behaving uh, with a time dependent behavior. So this is slowly moving down. The tunnels are somewhere here. And so clearly they are interacting with this large lens line. Uh, you see a plan view here when you see the tunnels and the lens light and the geological cross section again with the red line is sliding surface of the last sliding layer, which is mainly in a formation, or we call it in Italian argilla palombini, which is a stiff clay. Okay, consider it, this is a stiff clay with a time dependent behavior. Now, um, what about the interaction with the tunnels? Now, I hope this is, makes things clear from the geometrical point of view. What you see here with this uh, violet uh, reddish color is the surface of the, of the landslide. And you see highlighted here, the two areas where you have interaction between the, the mass of the movement of the movement and the lining of the tunnels. There are two tunnels. One is the south tunnel. The other one is the north tunnel. So well, this is still in Italian, but uh, I'm quite sure you, you, most of you at least can understand what, uh, what is written here. So this is north tunnel. That's the south tunnel. And you can see that the south tunnel has an interaction for around a hundred, less than 100 meters, while the north tunnel is more than 200 meters of interaction. 200 meters is not nothing. It's quite an important, uh, important interaction. Uh, these tunnels were built not too far ago, so they were excavated by a large TBM. So the lining is made by concrete uh, segments. And uh, um, what about that landslide uh, uh, before the construction of the tunnel? Well, the only information we have is due to satellite monitoring. So this is a kind of interferometric satellite monitoring. And what you see in this plot here is the displacement of some points on the surface versus time, okay, versus time. And again, in this slide, you also see with red, this area is when the North Tunnel was excavated with blue, when the, blue, the South Tunnel was excavated. And what we see clearly here is that before excavation, the area, the surface points, let's say they were moving. So the landslide were moving with this rate, sort of five millimeters per year as an average. When the tunnels excavation, when the TBM reached the area of the landslide, then the landslide started to move quicker. And you can see here, there's a, a, a dramatic change in the rate of displacement. And later on, after a few years, you see, after the, uh, the, the, the end of the excavation, the landslide uh, calmed down a bit, but still is moving at a rate which is a little bit higher than the one it was before the excavation of the tunnels. Mm -hmm. So during the excavation, we had a clear increase of slope this uh, of the slope displacements of the surface displacements. Uh, not much after the excavation uh, in 2013, in fact, this was observed in the tunnel. So some of the segments, particularly this one at ring 884, collapsed because of high stresses due to the movement of the landslide. And a number of this is collapsed, as you see here. But a number of others were found to be particularly suffering because of high stresses. So a detailed monitoring took place in the lining by means of door stopper. You see in these kind of uh, positions, what you see here is the results in terms of stress versus chainage. So measured in the lining. And you can see that in this area here, 
where I, I hope you see my mouse, in this area here, this is ring 884, the one which collapsed. In this area, which is the area below the lens light, stresses are quite higher than the rest of the lens light, of the tunnel, sorry. And we get up to 35, 40, 45 MPA of stress in the line. So one ring collapsed, the, some others were suffering. That was the evidence. So the evidence is we have large interaction with the lens. What, what occurred then? Uh, well, the, the, the concessionaire decided uh, that it was uh, good to, to make a reinforcement of the lining. So this is the original segment lining, the concrete segment lining. And the design was to build inside a steel reinforced structure, quite important, also quite expensive, as you can see here, to reinforce all the, um, all the original line. Well, this was not done for the whole tunnel, of course, but for the section interacting, mostly interacting with, uh, with the lens line. So that is the first uh, activity, let's say engineering kind of response to the interaction, right, to reinforce the, the, the system. But as we said before, there is this residual risk. The lens line is not gonna stop because we build the reinforcement inside the tunnel. So we still have to deal with, um, with the residual risk. Well, where we have the reinforcement, we will not have a risk of fragile, of brittle failure of the segments because now we have a steel uh, envelope inside. But what is, what is the lifetime of this tunnel? What is gonna happen? Uh, in the future. So we need to set up some sort of monitoring plan. And here you see a photo, here you have the tunnels, a photo, uh, sorry, a picture with the kind of, of sensors, remember redundancy. So here we are mo monitoring surface displacements. We're doing this by inclinometers, topographic measurements, satellite, uh, well, piezometer is not for satellite displacement, of course. So redundancy of measurement of surface displacements, in-depth displacement, so in the landslide body, thanks to inclinometers, some are automatic inclinometers, other are manual inclinometers, there are a number of them um, around the, along the slope, and you see that these, these, these colored lines here show the velocity measure it at different depth in the eye. We don't need to go into this detail just to let you know that these numbers are, some are zero, but some are higher than zero. Remember that five millimeters per year. And here we have millimeters per year, the same order of magnitude. So uh, it's just a, a, um, an indication that the phenomena is still ongoing. I mean, we're not stopping the lens light by building a reinforcement. Redundancy different types of sensors, different number of sensors, but also not only monitoring the landslide, but also monitoring the tunnel, redundancy. So we monitor the displacement of the, of the, of the surface, but we go into the tunnel and we put extensometers on the, on the steel reinforcements, flat jacks in the, in the, in the segments, uh, this is an uh, um, in intensive kind of measurements made by um, inclinometers, place it at diff in different cross sections. You see them here. So three types of different measurements to identify the stresses in the lining in the tunnel. So we, 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 call, we, we value the stresses in the lining, the displacements in the, in, the, in the landslide, but of course the stresses are due to the displacement. So the picture, needs to be consistent. Here, this is an, these are some data taken from the inclinometers, these ones into in the tunnel, these inclinometers in the tunnel. And I mean, uh, I don't know if you are much familiar with this kind of, this is the normal uh, force and this is the bending moment. Sorry for the Italian, I forgot to translate them. But you see these arrows, it's just showing in different points in the tunnel how the stress state is is changing. And of course, the black line is the strength. 
of the lining. And you can see that some, in some situations, we are getting closer, okay? We are moving from a situation to another one, and the second one is closer to the, to the strength. So the conclusion is that depending here and there, the cross section and so on, but in general, we might have a worsening of the stress condition, a worsening of the stress condition, which, which is rather obvious, but the main question mark is, okay, how long will the tunnel live in, in, in this condition? Mm -hmm. Because we wanna manage and we wanna live together with uh, this risk. So in order to do that, um, this is the third um, principle, prediction and performance. We have to do some computation. And I told you I teach numerical methods, so I like to, to go with that. We, we took some cross sections of the lens line, built some numerical models, 2D, 3D numerical models with the, with the scope of identifying long-term behavior and scenarios of evolution. So what will happen in 50 years time from now? And this helps us to define thresholds to build an early warning system. Hmm? Now, in order to do that, as I said before, you need appropriate geomechanical characterization, good constitutive modeling, and good numerical modeling. In this particular case, I told you it's, it, we had a problem of uh, it, it's it's governed by by creep, and um, um, oops, sorry, I opened one thing I should close. Uh, it's governed by creep, it's time dependent behavior. So we need a time dependent constitutive model. And this is the model we use, which has, and I'm not going into details of this, but it has a number of uh, constitutive parameters. So we have to calibrate the model so that we can, uh, we can think that our prediction is reliable. So the intensive work of calibration, identifying each single parameter. And how do you calibration? You can do calibration from laboratory tests. So you have to run careful, dependent laboratory tests. This is expensive, of course, because you have a time-dependent uh, triaxial test is a triaxial test that takes a lot of time, one, two, three months. Mm -hmm. So of course it's also expensive, but that gives you data, provides you with data that, that you can use to calibrate the parameters of the model we are using in this specific case. And then you have to move to the site scale because we're not modeling the, 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 the element volume, but we want to model the problem at the site scale. And so in, in, in by using this model, what we usually do is we tune some of the parameters. And how do we do that? We do what we call validation. So we have a lot of me measures. So our numerical model, which should be able to simulate excavation and to get to today is 2023. To, to, to predict up to 2023 and match with monitoring. That is what we call validation. So once you have that, then, and, and that works well, then we can say, okay, so now let's go ahead and let's, uh, we can assume that our prediction is, is reliable. Here you see some comparison with uh, laboratory tests. So this is the material, the argile palombini, the stiff clay I was, uh, mentioning. So, of course, we collected the samples at the site. We came to the lab at the Polytechnico and did triaxial test. And here you see a comparison between the experimental results and the computer results by using this specific constitutive law. So, it matches quite nicely. So, we move at the site scale with, with a, a well uh, built numerical model reproducing properly. The geometry, of course, uh, of the site, the geology, of course, but also the geometry of the lining. You see here the geometry of the lining and the construction process. And here you see some results. So if you look at these, the lines here, the lines are the displacements versus time of these three points in the model. And if you look at the central one, this is matching quite nicely with uh, the monitoring data from, from the satellite that we saw before. Okay, so this is validation. So if this, if this is validated, then we can try to, to push ahead and try to make a prediction and see what happens in 50 years time. And when we, and when we look at that, uh, we can, our interest is what's gonna happen to the lining of these tunnels. 
So here you see that the, the deformation, we said it before, the North Tunnel is much more influenced by this sliding. You see that the circle of your tunnel is becoming an oval. So that's why we use clinometers here to, to measure the, the, the deformation of, of this. And we, and we can look at the stress state in the lining. Here you have some examples of um, stress state in the areas where we have the structural reinforcement and in the areas where we don't have reinforcements. And uh, we don't need to go into details, but what you see here is that, of course, there is a change in stress starting from the construction, the, the construction of the reinforcement, and then going down to, what is this, to 2042, so 50 years from, from yesterday, from 2022, when we did the, 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 the computation. And you see that some points, not all, just some, some go beyond um, the, the, um, the strength of, of the material. Look, we are, we are talking about the strength of the concrete segments, not of the steel reinforcement. Okay, just the strength of the concrete segment. So this is an indication of the future uh, behavior of this. And we can use this as a framework, as a framework to evaluate our monitoring. So how do we manage this residual risk? Well, um, <clears throat> to, to build up this early warning system, you need to identify what are the risks. So the risk is that the tunnel will close, that you will have cracks. Of course, it depends from where you have the reinforcement or where you don't. So you have to identify that. As you see in these pictures, you this is usually done with very simple kind of, uh, of explanation. So like this, hmm? these are the, the risks. So how do we manage this? Well, if I wanna see if we open the cracks, we have to monitor the stresses in, in the lining, for example. If I wanna see a convergence, I need to measure um, displacement in the lining and, 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 and so on. Now, the system here, is built in order to monitor redundancy, principle of redundancy, surface displacement, in-depth displacements, information in the tunnel. So this is for the slope and this is for the tunnel redundancy. And then you have a number of instruments. You see a number of instruments. The, 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 the red ones are the ones used in the early warning system. So you measure everything. But in order to activate an alarm, this is the, 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 the hierarchy, hierarchy, I, I mentioned this word before, you only use some of these instruments. For example, automatic inclinometer. You don't use the manual inclinometer because manual inclinometers will be read once per month. You want a, something you, you read every hour to deal with an early warning system. You, you, we use inclinometers into, in the, um, in the tunnel and flat jacks. So these are automatic kind of readings, okay? So that's, that's an, an, an example of, of an early warning system to manage the residual risk of this big interaction. Now, just to, to close, I wanna show another couple of, uh, uh, just the other example very briefly, uh, which is related to this uh, landslide, which is here. I don't know if you can see, this is the area of a former open pit mine. This is the industrial estate, and clearly this is the lake. So a collapse here would cause a, a tsunami in, in the lake. And, and the, 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 well, the, the interaction is different here. We don't have tunnels, we have a lake, we have an industrial estate, but the, the, trigger, the, 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 the approach is, is very similar. So we have a large landslide, uh, how do we know that that is a landslide where we have to we monitor, we monitor, we detect uh, measurements. Of course, we do a geological and a geotechnical characterization. So we come up with a geological and geotechnical model. And this uh, is, is validated also from monitoring data. If you see the picture here on your right hand side, this is given, these are um, results from um, ground-based interferometric radar system. So each pixel, colored pixel, is a measuring point here. It's a reflection from, uh, from, from the scenario. 
And you can see the colors. Uh, well, these are numbers. It means where it's red is moving more, when it's yellow is moving less. Okay. If it if it not if it doesn't move, it's green. So it's clear that this helps you a lot in identifying the contour of the lens light. It's very helpful for that because it's very clear. You see red dots and yellow dots on the other side. So very clear. It's very helpful in that. So that's helpful also for building up a geological and geotechnical model. Then we, from a geotechnical and geological model, we go to the numerical model. So we select some cross sections, but we can also do 3D modeling. So I'm not going into the detail of modeling, but in this particular example, we, we did redundancy also in the modeling. So we did uh, continuum analysis, discontinuum analysis, and three-dimensional continuum analysis. Uh, let me go back a second here. So I told you that this it was an open pit mine. Now it's abandoned and open pit mine, but it was an open pit mine. So it was important here to have a reliable model to be able to follow the history of that slope. Like in the previous example, we had to simulate the excavation of the tunnel. Here we have to simulate the excavation of the open pit mine. So you see here, we have to go back reading um, paperwork from the, the, the beginning of the mine in 1900. 1973, 1985, year 2000, when the, when the, the, the mine was abandoned. And so now we have to reproduce that in order to have the, the, to have the proper state of stress in the slope and in the model. And then the output is what you see here in terms of, of, uh, of 3D. This is the same picture we saw before, uh, ground-based radar uh, monitoring. And this is the result of the numerical model. And well, you can you can clearly see that well, it, it's just a qualitative comparison, but it's quite nice. Okay, it's quite nice, which means we have a framework, uh, a reliable framework that we can use to build, to define thresholds and to build scenarios. In this particular case, we built three different scenarios. Um, one was, uh, I mean, uh, collapses. Of small portions of, of uh, the slope. The second scenario was a collapse of a larger portion up to this volume here. And the third scenario was the disaster of the collapse of the whole uh, landslide. Okay, so increasing the, the, the hazard was increasing there. Um, that was important. I'll show you in the next slide why it is important to define different scenarios. And then for each of these, Thanks to the numerical model, we were able to simulate the development of displacements versus time to distinguish the analysis that were going to collapse to those that were getting to an equilibrium. And thanks to this, try to identify thresholds. So in terms of displacement rate, millimeters per day in this particular case. And also, this was important for the early warning procedures, how much time you have available before collapse when one of one threshold is is overexceeded okay that was quite an uh, interesting um, activity uh, so once you have that in, in your hands you can build the, the full process of the early warning system and again um, redundancy quality of measurement so good measurement quality. Here we have topographic uh, systems, radar, uh, ground-based radar systems, inclinometers, so good quality sensors, but then redundancy, you measure space by different types of sensors in different positions. <clears throat> and a procedure that you see here, which is built thanks to the framework we use to evaluate. So it's written in Italian, and apart from that, it's very, very small. <laughs> so I'm sure you're not going to read it, but I, will, I can comment just a few things for you. If you see the green part at the top, that is no, no, no alarm. If you look at this, the second block here, this is the attention level. So what happens here? Well, if, we, if, you, have, if, if you exceed the first threshold, with some topographic measurements, you go into the attention level. 
And that is related to the scenario of small blocks, because it's just maybe one or two, well, here we said three uh, topographic measuring points which are moving, all the rest is stable. So that's the first scenario. But if then these points still move, then the pr process here requires to check this box here, you can't read, requires to check inclinometers. So to go in depth. So you, you looked at the surface, you, you, they are still moving. So, okay, let's do something more. Let's look uh, in depth. Also, inclinometers are moving. Okay, then you, you go up one level. You go up one level in your, um, in, in, in your uh, process. And, and you change the scenario because now you're not just saying it's not just a small portion on the surface, but it's something occurring also at depth, which means it's this one or the other one, but it's a bigger portion of. Okay, that, just an example to on how to how this early warning system was was built. Okay, and this is how things are then managed. As I said before. It is very important that the early warning system will evolve. I said that. Now it is important that we we, we simulate, we, we test our early warning system. So once we put it in place, we use data for for number of months to see if it works. If something has to be changed, this is an example with respect to an event we had in 2021, where. The, the, um, the topographic measurements, you can see them here, they, 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 they started to increase quite in a relevant manner, exceeding these thresholds here, but then they turn it back. And the procedure is also including when you, you go back to a lower level of alarm, because of course, each level of alarm has the, the, the consequence and then the activities that you have to, to do, okay? So in, in this case, we decided that five days, you, you had, we had to remain for five continuous days without any exceeding this level, then we could go down one level. That was the decision in, in, in this process. Okay, that's it. So that, I hope it was good to see some examples and, and, and comments that, that, that the conclusions are rather obvious after the talk. Uh, I just repeat the three principles, quality of measurements, redundancy, and prediction performance, so the ability to have a, a behavioral framework to, to evaluate our, 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 um, our, our early warning system and our scenarios. I hope the examples were, were helpful to, 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 to understand uh, the application of these principles and of course numerical modeling but I can say a very good uh, detailed uh, geomechanical uh, characterization and, uh, and laboratory testing was, um, was a key aspect to be able to build uh, reliable scenarios and of course predict the future behavior we will never be sure that the prediction is exactly right but at least is a direction and we can build our early warning system based on that. So that was, was uh, what I wanted to share with you. Down here, you have all my contacts, so you can take a note. Uh, if we want to interact in the future, I'm happy about that. So thank you very much for, uh, I, I see that there are some things in the chat, but I ask Miguel to guide me through this. Uh, this last part. I don't know if I should close the, the slides or not. Oh, I think we can leave them because uh, for sure we will have to go uh, to, to some of them in the in the questions. So Professor Barla, thank you very much for this very, very interesting presentation. I, I, I really enjoy it and I'm sure that all the attendees also enjoy it as well. So if, if you are okay, we can go to the, uh, to the question session. So I, I remind, remind the, audience, the, the attendees that you can still ask questions both in the chat or in the Q&A uh, chat of the, of the platform. So uh, le, le, let's start one from, from, from Juan Paulin, or, or president. So uh, he asked, this, did the steel frames use as reinforcement allow the deformation of the tunnels in a controlled way, so a convergence of, of the tunnel? 
Yeah, it's it's not. A, I, should I reply? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, it, it's not a. Um, it's it's a very stiff lining. Okay, so it's not a yielding lining like we would do for a squeezing uh, or a swelling um, uh, material. So it's not the principle of of yielding lining. It's a it's a really a stiff one because it, it's steel plates with concrete in, in the middle. So it's it's really a reinforcement. It's not not in the principle of of uh, deformation control uh, kind of system. Okay, so but I, I was wondering because the, the movement will continue. So basically, if you reinforce with a stiffer than before uh, element, it, it will get uh, very high stresses as well. And 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 then yes, I, I, I... Uh, it's very clear, and and you, you're right in the point, and it's a big discussion between geotechnical engineers and structural engineers because you can. Uh, you can feel here that uh, it's a dispute uh, between um, uh, reinforcing and, and building um, uh, important, uh, uh, let's say, looking it from the structural point of view, the, finding, sorry, I rephrase, finding the solution from the structural point of view. So I reinforce in a, in a way that the tunnel will live for other 50 years, even though it will carry more load the structure is so stiff that we can bury it. And another view is um, let, let, let the form and more then. a geological, geotechnical perspective, if you want. And we have to deal with the landslide. And the, the lining is something that will behave as the landslide wants. Perfect. So, but uh, it, also it, consider it, it, that uh, uh, one important aspect from the structural point of view is that. Seg concrete segments may fail in a brittle way, while this steel structure not. So that's a big difference, which um, higher, uh, makes uh, a big uh, step forward in terms of safety for the users. Yeah, you, you prevent like a kind of explosion of concrete, right? Because exactly, you have the- exactly. So you prevent that. So you can control things in a, in a controlled way. So even though it's not a yielding lining, but uh, still it's uh, in that idea. Perfect. And in your opinion, this is a continuation of the question from Juan. In your opinion, the damage would be less if the tunnel had been built deeper? Well, if, if, we, would, if we would go be completely below the landslide, uh, yes, the answer would be yes. Because uh, we, 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 if you look at the uh, cross sections outside the, the landslide, uh, also the and also monitoring of the stresses outside the landslide, yes, uh, definitely. Yes. I, I imagine that the landslide was identified after the construction of the tunnel, right? Well, as or I not? said, it's not so clear. I mean, it's not so easy to identify exactly the the the. the so the, the, the shear zone of a large landslide like that. And as I, as I said in the opening, um, despite the, all the effort you can do in investigation and so on, still due to the morphology of the country where we live, uh, sometimes it is unavoidable to, be, to interact with this kind of phenomenon. Of course, you, you, you want to avoid it, but sometimes you cannot completely at least. You need to mitigate. So the action is mitigation. Okay. Perfect. So I, I will be jumping from the Q and A and the and the chat. So this is a question from Alejandro Valdez. I, I'm not sure to which case he's referring, but he's asking about the measure of of humidity. Is this is this done in 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 any of those cases? Uh, not as a tool for early warning uh, systems. Um, of course, we measure um, water table and uh, the, the exometric level and the pore pressure in different locations for both uh, case studies. Mm -hmm. So not really humidity, but uh, the presence of water and, and, and the pressures in the, in the lens, light body. I, I, I imagine However, that they are this... not used. They are not used as a, a value on which uh, we set thresholds. In these two particular cases, we are not doing that because we identified that water is not the main uh, triggering aspect in these phenomena. It would be different for other instabilities we follow, but in this case, that's what we came out with. 
Yes, I, I, the, the graph that you show is uh, with time and the formation. It, it doesn't, you don't identify any stationality there. So the, the, exactly. the rain season does not seem to modify exactly. the. Exactly. Okay. Very good. So uh, a question from, well, uh, there is a, 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 some nice comments about uh, from Mohamed Isa. Well, thank you for the presentation and looking forward to see you in future events. So I, I think we can, uh, we, we also hope to, to have you here again uh, soon. Uh, this is a question from Angel Castro, which is um, he's also very, I know him, he's very involved in, in, in monitoring and uh, and he's asking during the presentation, you show examples of high, of highly analyzed your technical problems and the instrument used to monitor the phenomena expected on site. However, a question that came to mind is how do you think is the right person to propose the necessary instruments to be installed on site? Is it the designer of the model, an external expert with feedback from the designer or someone else? Additionally, who should be in charge of the installation? Should it be the owner of the construction, a third party, or the designer? Ah, yes, it's a very difficult, <laughs> a difficult to answer to this. Look, uh, in the cases we saw, um, uh, maybe it's an external consultant, uh, but uh, I, I would say it's not a single uh, person or, or group or team. It's a teamwork. In all cases, it was a teamwork. Yes, there is an external consultant, which is uh, giving uh, hints and uh, activities, but then uh, uh, monitoring systems are uh, managed by different uh, groups and companies. And uh, for example, if we look at the, the example of the, um, of the motorway tunnel, of course, the, the concessionaire of the motorway is the owner, let's say. And uh, the, the, they will um, they will have an engineering body uh, looking after monitoring, but then they would need different companies to provide the the, the measuring uh, systems, and they seek for the help of one or more consultants to guide them through the the, the, the choice of uh, of the instruments, and also not only not only choosing the instrument and building the the early warning system, but also um, testing it and following it during uh, during its uh, lifetime. So I don't know if I answered well, but I, I I would say yes. In such kind of situation, you it's good to have an external consultant which is not the designer and it's not the owner itself. So it's a triangle, the designer, the owner, and, and the external consultant. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, a question from Roberto Chacon Alvarez, who is asking, good afternoon, interesting topic. Have vulnerability studies been carried out with probabilities of occurrence in order to have risk management with this monitor? Oh, oh I, I lost you. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I think I lost my internet for a second. Okay. So did, did you hear the question or no, I repeated it? No, 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 not completely. Sorry about that. So Roberto Chacon is asking about uh, vulnerability studies, if they have been carried out with by, uh, to compute probabilities of occurrence of, of, this, uh, of these scenarios in order to have risk management with these uh, monitor models and parameters. Um, the, um, the analysis that were performed are not on a, a probabilistic uh, kind of framework. So the answer is no for the time being. One of the evolution that is planned is to go into some sort of a probabilistic framework. And uh, in order to do that, what we would like to do, this is particularly true for the first example, uh, what we would like to do is to first try to identify which are the parameters we should play with from a, let's say, probabilistic point of view. Okay. I, I also believe that we, we are taking longer to adopt this probabilistic approach compared, I don't know, to a structural engineer, engineer because our models takes more time to run. So we cannot do many of them, right? <laughs> That's right, yes. 
So uh, this is a question I think related to, to, to earthquake behavior. So because uh, Shima is asking if site response analysis could be important for future behavior of these landslides. Uh, sorry, what did you ask, site? Uh, site response analysis. I believe that he's asking about uh, a possible uh, uh, seismic uh, events. Ah, okay. Uh, well, uh, I didn't go through this, but particularly for the second example, uh, se the seismic uh, triggering was one of the triggering conditions for the potential collapse of the lens that was evaluated through numerical analysis. So uh, that was uh, one of the triggering conditions. Uh, we, we have, of course, we had to make an evaluation of the po possible uh, earthquakes that could occur in the area of, uh, of interest. And, and we use that as a triggering condition for the one of the possible triggering conditions of uh, for the landslide. Perfect, because you do have a, a, a seismic uh, yeah, activity that's right. in Italy, right? Yes, that's right. But luckily, uh, these two case studies are not exactly in the worst uh, areas. So from that point of view, I mean. Perfect. Uh, Roberto Chacon asks, how can you define the alarm states according to, to the displacement in relation to what can we determine them? Uh, well, this is rather complicated. In fact, uh, we, um, it's not really exactly on the displacement, but on the velocity, so the displacement rate. And uh, what we do is we try to in simple words, we try to simulate with the numerical models to, to reproduce the collapse and to distinguish between collapse and not collapse to, to see what, what, are the, uh, what are the conditions that, that brings us to collapse and what are the conditions that will not bring us to collapse. And then by comparing these two situations, we, we define a displacement that we assume to be uh, collapsed. And, and we see what is the velocity in, uh, in, in, in that uh, specific uh, position. And we use that, uh, I have to say, by also by applying a number of safety factors, in fact, but we use that number to define the thresholds. And then we, and then we evaluate the, those thresholds with monitoring, of course, but the order of magnitude needs to be, be consistent with what, uh, with what we see. In that regard, I, I wonder, because uh, at, at least in these cases, as, as the uh, landslide was already moving, you were able to, to calibrate uh, very objectively the, the numerical models. But wh what is your opinion in situation, for example, with, with brittle materials? So uh, where, where the, the worst case is a brittle failure, we basically cannot have any previous history of, of this situation to calibrate the model, because if this happened, the, everything the, basically is collapsed. So, so we don't have this, let's say, um, calibration for this situation. So what, what are your thoughts about, about that? Well, um, it, it's a very a fairly common uh, situation that uh, of not having a full uh, picture of, um, of the situation. Um, so, uh, one one way forward is uh, to, to calibrate at the laboratory level. So, for example, in a time-dependent behavior, we can do calibration at the laboratory, uh, the element scale. However, we know that uh, in, in our problems, often we have a, let's say, a site scale effect. And, and so this is not a, a full uh, solution no okay but it's it's a it's a first way forward let's say and and also um if you if you're not able to apply a quantitative approach fully then you would need to start with a phenomenological approach and as i said that the early warning system evolves so it may also evolve from a, a phenomenological approach to start with and then, so what do I mean? I mean, if I'm looking at a, a small landslide and I, I know nothing and I have to set thresholds, I can define thresholds on the basis of experience. But then, of course, I will use the monitoring data to see if that those thresholds make sense or not. And I will update my, my, my early warning system on the way, on the way to go. And, and 
on the way, I will collect information, I will collect uh, samples, I will do testing, then I will have enough data to make models. And so I will update again and go from a phenomenological approach to a quantitative approach. So it's a process. Perfect. Oh, I, I think that Mohamed Isa is familiar with your work because he's asking you if in the future we will we could have a, a talk about geothermal structures. So maybe we can lock down this now for, for, for a future talk. Yeah, it's a pleasure, yes. We, we did a lot of work on that recently. Hmm. So uh, Jonathan Ramirez asks, uh, how often or how common is to, to, to feed the numerical modelings with uh, measuring data during construction in, in some uh, civil engineering project? So you mean uh, prediction and performance during con during construction? Well, in, in if, if I understand well the the, the, the question, well, in, I think that in in geotechnical engineering, particularly in tunneling engineering, this is is um, okay. How can I say um, everyday life? So it, it's quite uh, well starting from the observational method and uh, the definition of the observational method back in the past. But it's, uh, it's it's well used and well known, and it, in fact, it's a, it's a, an issue um, when we deal with structural engineers. I mean, sometimes it, it, I, I think that this idea of uh, let, let's define it observational method because that's uh, the right name we give to this, or interactive geotechnical design also. Uh, it's well um, introduced in uh, geological and geotechnical uh, discipline. It's, uh, mm, I don't want to say new, but it's uh, more recent in the structural engineering field. So sometimes there is some misunderstanding there among us. But I think that in, in our discipline, it's it's well, particularly in tunneling engineering, it's well accepted. Perfect. So uh, a lot of congratulations for a very interesting presentation from Andresa, from Roberto, from uh, Willington, from uh, Josette, Miguel, Alejandro, uh, Lionel. Um, uh, Lionel also asked, how did the calibration of macro and micro parameters of the discrete element model and how many particles they con considered? Well, this is, uh, we, uh, this is a query on a, on a, on a different topic here. Um, uh, I, in, the, in the exams, we did not use uh, particle element modeling, in fact. However, particle element modeling is one of the uh, the, the option we have available, particularly in distinct element uh, with distinct element method, the aspect of uh, calibrating micro parameters is the time consuming uh, stage. And, um, and, and again, you need, uh, I would say, you need uh, what, what we do usually is we calibrate micro parameters with respect to a laboratory test. So we run uh, synthetic tests with the numerical model and real tests with the triaxial equipment, and and we try to calibrate on that. There is I, I have a paper on, on this. If I mean, if you have my contacts here. You can email me. I can I can share it with you if you want. Now I didn't get the name of the of the person, but just email to me in the next days. I will reply. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question about the length of, of the affected zone, but I, I think this was answered in the presentation. Maybe he, he missed that part. It, it was more or less at the center of the of the of the tunnel. Exactly. Uh, yes, I believe so like 150 meters. Yeah. Perfect. It, it was like a hundred for one and like two hundred and fifty for, for the other. Exactly. Yeah, because of course it's a, it's a little bit different. But let's say two hundred and fifty is the maximum area. Okay. Uh, uh, there and is course, a question. These numbers are uh, are rough numbers because nobody really knows exactly where uh, where the, the shear zone is. Of course, we 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 infer it from 
from the point measurement we made with the clinometers and with the measurements we do in the tunnel, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, one question from, from my own uh, is, is because I know that you have done work about uh, this uh, yielding system in, in a squeezing ground. Uh, is, is this was a, let's say a, 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 an option that was a, a no 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 because it, no not really because uh, this is a tunnel under service and um, um, I mean uh, the, the the kind of yielding uh, systems we we have used them during construction is more related to the previous query you know the observational method so to um to allow uh, a controlled construction sequence of the tunnel here we are some years after construction and what we what the, the, the scope of this is to keep the tunnel live for a number of years let's say the 50 okay. years of uh, tunnel life and maybe more perfect uh a question from miguel diaz uh Due to your experience, how can we relate the monitoring reports with the results obtained from the numerical modeling, from the displacements from the numerical modeling? I, I think uh, he's referring to a situation where these two things are, are very decoupled, right? So it's like you we have to run the model again. And... Uh, let, allow me to, to uh, reply with a joke. You have to run the model again because uh, I mean, if, if the quality of measurement is a good quality, then we have to rely on measurements and we have to understand why the model is saying something different. There must be something that we are not matching. Geometry, geology, uh, constitutive modeling. So, it, of course, it, it always happens like that. You have to work hard to, to make things match. Mm -hmm. It, it, it also might might be also asking because he he uses the word report so like a like a like a piece of paper you know M okay. maybe m maybe is is uh he's talking about a very decoupled situation okay, where the, okay. maybe the monitoring report arrives several days after and uh, I, I I think that that's maybe a thing that we can uh, improve in many parts of the world to have a more direct communication between uh, analysis and, and monitoring, right? Okay, now I got it now. Yeah, look, it's a very important point, in fact. However, um, for example, for the first case study I showed, we have reports every three months. So, we, of course, we receive uh, the data are collected every hour for the early warning system, but the report is written and, and um, sent every, delivered every three months. So we receive these information every three months, but uh, uh, then uh, it is it is important that the report will um, include all the relevant information that will allow me, for example, that are doing the modeling, to evaluate the modeling. So if since in that particular case I'm acting as a consultant, I will ask the ones delivering the report. So please deliver the report with these characteristics so that then I can use it. So that's the way forward, I think, to have a strong interaction between uh, between the partners, the team. It's a teamwork, as we said before. Perfect. So uh, again, congratulations for the presentation from, from Luis and from Gianluca. So also people from from Italy, I, I think so. I know this one. <laughs> uh, and also Juan Paulin is uh, mentioned that uh, the, this year will be our fifth uh, national congress of of Amitos, and we you of course are invited to to participate. Maybe maybe you you could revisit Mexico after <laughs> for the second let's time in one year. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Thank you, Perfect. Annie. Very much appreciated. Yes, uh, and also this message is for all the attendants. Uh, we we will have the the congress uh, uh, this year, so so please feel free to. You will find the the information in our web page, and and you will uh, also be able to to send a, an abstract if you want to participate with a presentation. So we welcome you all to to send us your your work to to be considered. And I think we went to all the, the, the questions, Professor Parla. So uh, just let me check again. Yes, I think so. 
So I, I think that the, the only thing left is to say thank you again. We really, really enjoyed the, the presentation and this is something that we need to, 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 to improve and to incorporate in every relevant engineering project here in Mexico and, and everywhere, uh, everywhere else. So th thank you very much for the presentation. So feel, feel Amitos as, as, as your home to, to, to go thank back uh, frequently. And also thank to all the attendees and for the very interesting questions that they, they posted. Thank you very much for that. And also thank you to our sponsor for this uh, for this talk, Cis uh, Cisgeo. I think it's Cisgeo. Right? Okay. O also an Italian company, I, I believe, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a very a very Italian uh, event today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, thank you all and have a very nice uh, day and very nice evening there in Italy. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Have this. <laughs> Adios.